So that basically covers my half of the talk. <laughs> um, just to provide a bit of background into BRT, um, you can see there it's been in the pipeline for quite some time. Um, the OBC was approved in 2012. Um, we began delivery in April 2013 with the launch date on the 3rd of September this year. You can, um, it's operated by TransLink under the brand name Glider. As it said, there's a 90 million pound investment, which basically breaks down as 22 million pound for vehicles, 10 million pound for depot and a contribution towards TransLink's next generation picketing project, and then 50 million pound on infrastructure improvements along the route. I want to just set out some of the key features of any bus rapid transit system. It's high capacity vehicles, off board ticketing, and a high level of bus priority along the route. If you don't have those three, it's not a bus rapid transit system. So looking at the vehicles, you can see some of the characteristics of them. And I'm sure many of you have seen them traveling around Belfast now. Uh, TransLink are telling us that the Glider fleet in performing is they're getting something like a 10 to 40% improvement in the fuel efficiency of these vehicles compared with their metro fleet and a 90% reduction in the nitrogen oxides and particulate matter emissions. So it's a massive improvement on the fleet and a step change in vehicles. And that's the whole point, that one BRT vehicle has the potential to carry over 100 passengers and with the average occupancy in a private car traveling in and around Belfast at just over one passenger per car. Um, you can see the potential is there to remove approximately a half a kilometer congestion on each glider vehicle in theory. Then the other aspect is off-board ticketing. The point of that is to reduce the dwell time of the vehicles at the halts, again to produce more reliable and quicker journeys. Again high quality in what we have tried to deliver here and we've reduced the number of stops along the routes and tried to space them approximately 400 meters apart. There's real-time passenger information, CCTV and the ticketing equipment all at the platform like halts. Then just an overview of the routes for anyone who's not familiar with them starting in East Belfast at the Dundonald Park and Ride, traveling down the Upper Newton Arge Road Albert Bridge Road through the city centre and the same bus takes or same vehicle takes you across city into the west end, um, Devis Street, Falls Road, Andersonstown and Stewartstown Road past the, the new sustainable transport hub, Colin Connect on the Stewartstown Road and terminating at McKinstry Road roundabout on the outskirts of West Belfast. So in terms of the infrastructure requirements, Basically, we need we were looking for a uh, three meter minimum running lanes and 2.5 meter minimum footways for the design principles. Moving to curb in that gullies to try to reduce impact on ironwork along the routes and produce a smoother ride. So again, the resurfacing of the carriageway and the adjoining footways. Um, we made the decision to introduce LED street lighting along the routes and extra low voltage LED traffic signals, which respectively are producing energy savings of around 50% and up to 70%. Then there's the upgrade of the traffic signal equipment also allowed us the bus priority measures within the traffic signals and to upgrade the pedestrian facilities right along the route. Then the civils contractors at the same time, while they had the road open, also made provision for the future installation of the BRT halts in the final stage of delivery. As you can imagine with a program of this nature, pulling together infrastructure, vehicles, depots, 
things like that. There's a fair degree of program management, and the department worked in partnership with Amy Consulting in the development of that program, and the ensure coordinated design, land acquisition, coordination with underground utilities, and then also the procurement and delivery. So the procurement strategy that we adopted, if you consider that within this program there were 14 construction projects, there were 10 highway projects, two terminal facilities, Dundonald Park and Ride, and the Colin Connect Transport Hub. Then on top of that you also had TransLink led the halt installation, so the rollout of 102 halts with all the ticketing equipment and all at that within the last 12 months of delivery. And then an interdependent project, again TransLink led and delivered by Henry Brothers, the replacement depot, um, the Mile Water Service Station down in off Duncrew Street. So then if we focus down into the road schemes themselves, we divided them into three packages of work. There were a mixture of NEC option A and B contracts between £1 million up to £4.5 million. And we programmed, we programmed the delivery of those packages to avoid working on two consecutive sections of the road at once and also to maximise the bus priority impact in the final package of works. So in the east you can consider that that's the section between Knock Road and Dunlady Road. And in the west it was the section through Anderson's Town, which historically was an area of fairly high congestion. From a client's perspective, one of the main challenges that we faced was maintaining stakeholder buy-in through such a long drawn out delivery process before you saw the fruits of your labour. As you can see, the statutory consultations on the policy proposals were way back in 2009. Um, so how we did that was, it was early and frequent engagement with key stakeholders. So when you think about the elected reps, you were talking about the Committee for Regional Development were receiving updates and then the Infrastructure Committee while they were going and also trying to keep the local councils well informed. Um, the elderly and disabled lobby in particular, um, the engagement with them was absolutely invaluable and was key to some of the serious design changes, both on the vehicle and at the halts. Um, some very, very useful engagement with that. And then during the design of each section of the roadworks, we went out and held public information days to make sure that the local community along that section had a say in the design before it was finalised. Um, then TransLink again stepped in with some very extensive public engagement in the lead up to Go Live, travelling around all the secondary schools along the routes, primary schools, all the major shopping centres and attractors. Glider made a show at the West Belfast Festival and Eastside Festival, things like that. Fantastic getting the word out and get building the excitement in those key couple of months just before go live in September. So that's a bit of background from a client's perspective and now I'd like to hand over to John to give an insight in the construction phase from the contractor's perspective. Thank you Peter. Okay so like Peter says I've been asked to give a, a bit of contractor's perspective uh, on the delivery of the BRT infrastructure. John McQuillan Contracts delivered four phases of the Belfast Rapid Transit and I had an involvement in each of the four in the role of project manager. So if Peter mentioned the phase delivery, I'm going to talk about the 12 infrastructure schemes here, um, not mentioning the two translink led schemes that Peter mentioned. So 50 million worth of infrastructure improvements, 12 number schemes, highway and terminal, and there were six contractors involved, all Northern Ireland based contractors. The first five of which appear here would have established reputations in the area of road construction and maintenance, uh, mainly with their own production facilities for aggregates of bituminous materials. Form construction, perhaps more of a more renowned for building and general construction works, and they were involved in the Colin Transport Hub building. Here we've got a chronological list of the phases as they were delivered. 
the completion dates you see, sorry, the dates you see, the years are all dates which the schemes were complete. Peter mentioned uh, the seven of the twelve here were complete by the end of 2017, and Peter mentioned how the department were sure and rolled them out. Uh, that there was no adjacent schemes or side-by-side -side phases delivered concurrently. Um, also, you'll notice there's a balance of east and west, I suppose, to spread the disruption. So in 2015, for instance, uh, Upper Newton Arge Road between Sandown and Knock was being worked on by White Mountain. Uh, and also in 2015, we did our first phase on the Falls Road between Grosvenor and White Rock. And there were five schemes remaining to be delivered in a, in a big push this year ahead of the BRT launch in September 2018, and again you see the spread with uh, Falls Road, White Rock to Finnehy, <coughs> and Stewartstown, McKinn Street to Michael Ferguson in the west, and Upper Newton Road Road ongoing in the east, together with City Road in the city of Finnehy. So if, if you allow me, there's probably a bit of overlap here with Peter's slide on requirements. Um, from an engineering point of view, the works are essentially a high concentration of highway maintenance bundled together. Um, typical of the what the contractors in the first day would be delivering day in, day out uh, for the department across Northern Ireland. The, range of, the, the main principle is of a new cross section with two inbound and two outbound lanes. That's, that's for the vast majority of the route with the near side lanes in each direction being dedicated bus lanes. Range of measures include carriageway widening. Footpath reconstruction and adjustment works, and then along with that, alterations and diverges, diversion of existing services and utilities usually go hand in hand. Drainage measures, traffic signal works, both new installations and alterations to existing traffic signal systems, LED street lighting systems, carriageway surfacing and resurfacing, and then obviously road markings and signage. So I've mentioned it's difficult to spend too much time on the design side of it. It's you know not without its day-to-day -day challenges for highway maintenance work, but uh, essentially the, the engineering aspect of the schemes is reasonably straightforward. The challenge is mainly laid elsewhere, but to pick up on two design aspects which I believe added value. Peter had talked about the curve entry, the side entry, sorry, and curve inlet gullies. Uh, the glider, if you've observed the glider bus within the three meter lane, it occupies the vast majority of the available width. So it helps to have the side entry gratings and you're not trafficking repeatedly over gully gratings. You will find if you go looking for them here and there, there's the odd location where there's a standard gully grate, um, normally because of uh, existing constraints below ground that it wasn't possible to alter. Selective mastic asphalt reinstatement to metalwork. Uh, it's a very topical in highway maintenance nowadays and we could, put on, we could no doubt run a separate presentation on it, but uh, it was used, certainly in the four schemes that we delivered, it was used mainly in bus lanes. Um, the, the two main benefits believed to be offered, like I say, it's a relatively new technique, probably up to five years in use in Northern Ireland. The two main benefits believed to be offered by the system. Um, at a location in carriageway metalwork, which would traditionally be the most likely uh, area that the item of metalwork on the surrounding surface would be the most likely area for failures and highway maintenance. The flexibility provided by the product uh, and the system to the surface adjacent to the cover is a benefit. Uh, you've also got traditional traditional methods of, of setting carriageway metalwork. You lay your binder course, you come along then and you raise you raise the co the cover the chamber cover and set it to the anticipated carriageway surface course level. With the mastic asphalt reinstatement system. You have the luxury of laying your surface course, coming along, cutting out, and setting the chamber cover to perfectly match, or at least that's the idea, the laid surface course at that point. So generally, you've got improved surface regularity and a better running surface. Also, during resurfacing, surface, it removes the need to leave items raised between laying of binder course and laying of surface, surface course. So you've got reduced risks there in terms of health and safety and public liability from our point of view. The aesthetic on the other side of the coin, the aesthetic impact is to be considered. Some people get a wee bit irate about introducing a saw cut into a newly laid surface course, but you can see there that the appearance is pretty close to that rolled asphalt. 
There were many challenges then, and there were many in no particular order. Service utility works, alterations and new installations, particularly in 2018 when we saw we had, I think it was five schemes, all running and jockeying for position with the various service and utility bodies to, to, get, to get the work done on a rolling basis and the alterations made ahead of the September launch. So, you know, there's probably half a dozen service utility bodies involved across the schemes and it was it was a real challenge to to manage and program all the required service utility alteration works and new installations. Traffic management, no surprise that in busy urban areas both vehicular and pedestrian traffic management was key and with much discussion before and during implementation of uh, lane closures, road closures and the like with the FI roads traffic section. The last two here I'm going to cover in a bit more detail in the next in the slides which follow. The expectations of the general public and, and stakeholders and also time constraints. And there's two aspects to the time constraints I'm going to touch on. There's the overall contract periods and the overall program duration for each phase. And then there's the working hours, so that's the, the restrictions imposed due to traffic management systems normally on the daily working window that you have. So on expectations here, um, the challenge of management of public and stakeholder expectations, proactive consultation measures that we and the other contractors un employed included variable message signs, PMS units like the one you see on the screen here, for notification of ongoing roadworks, uh, for advanced notification of road closures that were planned during off-peak periods. Um, in form of letter drop, so we would have letter dropped on the overall scheme, each scheme pre-work commencement, and then on a rolling basis, on a sectional basis, we would have letter dropped and door-to-door -door calls at the affected residences and businesses to explain the nature of the works, uh, the anticipated duration of the works, and provide contact details for anybody who wants to get in touch with us. Liaison with uh, local community groups. Uh, if I can give the example on Stewartstown Road, uh, between McKinstry and Michael Ferguson, uh, which, which was completed summer of 2018. There are a couple of very active uh, neighbourhood groups there, the Cullen Neighbourhood Partnership and the Cullen Safer Neighbourhood Project. We were, we engaged them at a very early stage and it, they provided us, they're very active, both groups on social media, and it proved to be an excellent medium for communicating with locals. Um, really took off sometimes in terms of letting people know in advance of road closures and, and planned works. Liaison with key stakeholders. I've mentioned TransLink, local businesses, DFI Roads traffic section as well. I mentioned earlier uh, on an ongoing basis as we were as we were proposing systems of traffic management and, and pre-booking road closures. Uh, with TransLink, the works to bus halts uh, they were a key item uh, for consultation. Uh, the coordination of migration from existing bus halts to new bus halts. Uh, temporary measures and temporary stops that were put in place and we reached the point where we maintained a shared log that was shared on at least a weekly basis with TransLink uh, which detailed the status of bus halts, existing bus, bus halts that were uh, temporarily suspended or permanently, permanently out of uh, action and details of the temporary measures that were put in place. Social media then the pros and cons of social media have touched on the liaison through the local community groups and if you'll allow me maybe to add a wee bit of humour into it at this stage. I've carefully blackened out the Twitter here. Uh, this this is so the, the weekends the, the week a lot of the time we opted for weekend resurfacing works. Typically you're cutting off about half a kilometre um, of, of carriageway resurface and so on this particular weekend we were in on the Saturday night on Upper Newton Ard Road. We planned out just north of a thousand tons. Um, we put preparation ready for the surface and squad and on the Sunday morning at six o'clock. I think there was approximately 600 tons of hot roll asphalt laid on the Sunday. This is just at the end of the section and that's all the plant and all the logistics and all the transport that goes along with that. No issues with rolling straight edge test or texture depth test and you come into Coming to work the next morning in reasonably good form after you've got the update from the night before, however, how well. And this comes through. 
uh, I think the Belfast Telegraph were on to the department pretty short after that, but uh, it was cured within a couple of hours. But to be fair to the poor play martyr, I think he'd been, that was at the end of the section, I think it's Cabin Hill Junction. He'd been there from about 11, 12 o'clock on a Sunday, and those were the last markings applied at 11 or 12 o'clock on a Sunday night. But never that I can tell a good story. So that's one of the cons of social media. Time constraints are moving on to then. So, like I said, there's two aspects the overall program durations, and I'm going to touch on the logic of the programs, and then working restrictions, working, working hour restrictions. So, a bit of detail here. We've talked about I've talked about charge bay resurfacing now, and that's probably what catches the eye, the you know, the off peak, the night time, and the the weekend resurfacing where you've got large large amounts of pump equipment, backup pump equipment, and you're resurfacing maybe half a kilometer section at a time. But what really dictates the overall duration of the program, your footpath reconstruction, and more so your carriageway widening. We 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 would have had targets and theoretical outputs for footpath reconstruction. Which you can you can be reasonably confident of because if you're reconstructing the footpath and the curbs remain in the same place, there's limited scope for, for things to go wrong and slow you down. Where well, there's carriageway widening, inevitably when you move curb lines, uh, you will have services and utilities that are conflicting with the proposed alignment of the new curb line. And also you have services and utilities at shallower depths that are in footway that's going to become carriageway. So with the best will in the world. EMA and the department have tried to plan the required service alterations, but there's unforeseen always as you, as you progress through the works. 2014, 2014 Falls Road, uh, Grosvenor to White Rock. What I've done there, the 1.4 kilometres, all these schemes, there's footways or carriageway widening on both sides. You double that, you divide it by your 45 weeks. That's what we were being asked to provide as an average output, 62 metres per week. Like I say, you have enough time within that overall duration to drop in your carriageway resurfacing at nights and at weekends. It's usually a separate resource post. Albert Bridge Road was the next scheme that we delivered. Something similar, we've got less 50 metres per week average. And then as you approach the launch date in 2018, somebody more cynical than me would suggest that these, these anticipated or requested increased inputs was was maybe due to the approaching finish date and the period available between the tender and the launch date, but I'm not <laughs> going to suggest that. Uh, Stewartstown Road, double it up, you're into 95, double up the 2.1 kilometres and do the miles, you're into 95 metres a week. And Upper, upper Newton Arge Road, which was really double the length of the other schemes above, just under 4 kilometres, it was 123 metres per week, which was a requirement. Um, it was a real concentrated program of work. So of the 60, if I note here, I think of the 60 weeks, approximately 40 weekends, we had something going on, be it road crossings off peak or carriageway resurfacing works. Uh, particularly in the last two, three months, we were almost into a day shift, night shift pattern in that scheme. And it leads me into the working hours restrictions. At an early stage, when we sat down with the department having been awarded this scheme, I was pointing to this requirement versus this requirement. Uh, the top three schemes here, the daily working pattern, the, the lane closures, the half night to half four restriction was imposed uh, due to let peak traffic flows move without disruption. Uh, at an early stage, we were saying if we're going to stand any chance of achieving this, we were, we were pushing for 24 hour continuous lane closures to carry out the footpath reconstruction and the carriageway widening works. So it was run initially on a trial basis, and in the end up it remained through the scheme. And it demonstrates very simply there, if you're if you're restricted half nine to half four, that's first going out, start setting your TM up at half nine. You know, quarter past half past ten, best case scenario, you can hope to be starting work. At the other end of the day, you're having to start stripping off, reinstating to open that lane um, at half three to be off completely for half four. So you've taken your window down from, uh, what do you want to say, you want the times we were working 8 to 6, you've taken that down to half 10 to half 3. You've really half the working day available, and you can see it there in the way it came to pass, the 120 versus 60 metres. And the other thing that it does in terms of your, your systems of work, if I can give a very simple example of curbing, if you're curbing a section at the edge of the carriageway and you're restricted half 9 to half 4, whatever you open up, you have to curb and reinstate and leave safe for traffic to run past it again the next morning. 
Um, if you have a continuous lean closure, you can focus on excavation and preparation of cured base and come in and do a long section. So um, I've harped on long enough about it, but you can see from our site how, how the increased outputs can be achieved if, the, if there's no restrictions daily on the working period. Just it's really only a graphic for you uh, on that scale. Believe it or not, this is a, a sample of a revision of the program on Auburn Newton Large Road, now to Dunlady. Uh, if you believe it or not, that's a compressed version of the program. Each of these phases that you're looking at is a section of footway indicated over here, which I appreciate you can't read. But they're, they've been closed up within each uh, phase of footway reconstruction or carriageway widening. There could be a dozen items there, everything from excavating the drainage, the curb, and the service and hill alterations. And it's that level of detail and monitoring that level of detail on an ongoing basis that's required to keep you on program. The blowing up section here is carriage area service and works. So a wee bit of information on the project management side of things and how it ran. Uh, it was beneficial that we were working with proactive teams from Amy and DFI Roads. Uh, several of them are present here today, so I'm going to say that, I'm going to, really. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, all joking aside, that there's so many variables involved. Um, decisions and actions need to be taken without delay to keep these projects on track. We met weekly on site, uh, myself and our site team, together with the Amy site management team. That's an agenda of what we covered. and. You know, week on, you couldn't afford to miss a weekly meeting. Week on week, there were so many changes in service utility alterations, keeping ahead with applications uh, for road closures and lane closures and making sure they hadn't timed out, health and safety, uh, and the monthly progress meetings, which involved the DFI road staff. It was the same, essentially the same agenda, albeit covered at a higher level. So coming towards the conclusion here and to wrap up from the contractor's perspective or from, from my perspective, here are a, a few areas uh, which are certainly worth consideration for, for similar future projects. The coordination of service utility works. Well, it's a big an issue or it's a big a difficulty in the earlier years when there was less schemes in the ground at any one time. But certainly in 2018, um, I mentioned earlier, there was a high volume of service utility alteration work to be delivered. And without getting into it in too much detail, there's, there's room for improvement in terms of coordination and planning with some of the utility bodies. Some of them were very helpful um, coming and meeting with us, programming. And essentially, a lot of the time, it was our squads that were carrying out the civil works and the preparation works. And then we were relying, out, relying on their pipe layers or cable layers, if you have to come in. And, and carry out the service alteration work so you can't you can't get them on board early enough really to, to plan out the guard works traffic signal works again um all ran fairly smooth big demand placed on it was uh, the same subcontractor that dfi roads were using for the alteration to existing traffic signal on the new installations so again it's something that's um, it's important to plan carefully and ensure that there's there's adequate resource both on the part of the main contractor to carry out the Preparation works and on the on the traffic signal works contractor to ensure they have adequate resources available. The balancing of working hours restrictions versus overall scheme durations. Talked about that in a fair bit of detail earlier. It's something I think for the department and if, if north south would ever come on, it's it's definitely something to weigh up the overall duration. Um, versus the daily working hours. We went through the detail earlier on the impact it has of imposing restrictions so that the general public and, and general traffic can, can move without disruption in peak flow periods. Management of stakeholder and public expectations. The uh, advent of social media provides avenues for anybody and everybody who wants to be heard. And while stakeholder consultation from, is key and it must be a priority, um, I think there's a balance to be struck, and this is for contractors as well. We were obviously using it, tweeting them through our own social media to advertise things. My opinion is that your replies, where people query and ask questions, I think it should be more of a general response 
if you go down the route of replying to someone specifically and continue down that route, there's there's no telling where it can take you. So I think it's it's better to to provide general information. Okay, so thank you for listening. Uh, I think if there's any questions, Peter and myself, feel free to direct more to Peter, but we'll do our best to <laughs> we'll do our best to answer. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robert. Um, if I can just kick off to give people time to think. Um, the, the first question you mentioned a lot of vehicle detection going on for the approach to the new signals. Did you actually have to upgrade a lot of the controller cabinets with the cores and monitors? Yes, Karen. Um, all of the equipment at the traffic signals at the vast majority of the junctions, certainly along the arterial routes, it's slightly different than the city centre, but all of the traffic signal junctions along the routes were upgraded to um, extra low voltage, or sorry, aye, extra low voltage and LED. And we also took the opportunity to introduce MOVA to the vast majority of the junctions along the routes to squeeze that extra capacity out of the traffic signal junctions. And then, as well as that, the bus priority um, bits within the controller as well to enable to enable us to make use of selective vehicle detection as and when we need it. You know, there's one thing worse than a bus that's late; it's one that's early. So you need to be careful about how you use your bus priority capabilities. You know. Um. Uh, Peter, John, uh, thanks very much for your uh, excellent presentation. I'm uh, now bus based on myself because I'm sure I'm not a good buyer, so I've seen what will happen. Um, I know it's early days yet, but I just want to ask um, what the uptake has been like from the general public and are there any stocks yet on, say, improvements on general road congestion? Okay, I'm really glad you asked that question because I meant to mention it during my presentation and didn't, didn't get a chance or it slipped my mind. But the early indications coming from TransLink are that there's a patronage increase on the BRT routes of between 17 and 20%. So that equates to approximately 30,000 extra public transport journeys per week compared with this time last year. So you can see that the investment and the step change in public transport provision, as as you said, and as I totally agree with you, it's our it's early days yet, and let's see whether those figures are sustained. However, I mean a growth of a twenty percent overnight growth in public transport on these routes speaks for itself. I think. In terms of traffic congestion, um, in the general traffic, it's a wee bit early to tell whether there's a significant change. I mean, the model, the transport model, suggested that we we could see a 20 odd percent improvement in public transport journey times versus a 10 percent detriment in the general traffic journey times along the routes. To be honest with you, and it is only anecdotal at this stage, we're not really seeing that. There are certain areas, for example, the likes of Anderson'stown and bits of Stewartstown Road, and even through Ballyhackamore, where it was expected that bringing in the bus lanes would grind these areas to a halt. The transport modelers assured us that that would never be the case, and that's what we're finding on the ground, that actually some of these areas, the extra road space, albeit as bus lane, actually means that the congestion isn't appearing because people have space to get into, to get around obstructions, like right turning vehicles, for example. Was there, is there a target? Is there a, what, what is the target? Well, there, there's no, there, was no, there, there was no target of detriment, for want of a better word. We weren't trying to hammer the private yeah. motorist, if, if you know what I mean. The target was a 20 to 30% improvement in journey times for public transport, but more importantly, an improvement in the reliability of the public transport provision, you know, and the increased services. Our feeling was that if you're able to provide a reliable, modern public transport system, that that will be a draw. So it's more carrot than stick. And to my mind, 
that's what we're finding so far. Uh, Peter and John, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I look forward to seeing less congestion as a result of glider. Uh, I'm pleased that you acknowledge the role that stakeholders have in the, uh, the, in the development of such, such schemes. I am particularly pleased that so much was taken on board from the engagement with the older people and the disabled people sector. Um, I have two questions, comments. Uh, you both referred to uh, utilities, uh, and I wonder if, with all the new surfacing that has been put down, and there is an incredible amount of new surfacing that's been made in Belfast over the past two years. Is there a period during which utilities have been banned from coming along and opening up and destroying these lovely smooth surfaces or these nicely prepared hulks? And the other comment I have is uh, bus lanes got an awful lot of publicity uh, in, the, in, the initial, in the initial periods of this. Has that settled? But in addition, did the department give any serious consideration to the concept of red routes as used in London? Okay, Bert, thanks very much. Um, the first question with regards to the utilities, I mean, as statutory undertakers, they have certain authority to um, provide new connections and to carry out, obviously, to carry out emergency work for failures and things like that. So we, the department can't hold those utilities for those particular types of things. However, there is an embargo on planned utility works, you know, after the completion of major road work schemes. Um, however, I think that's only 12 months or 24 months. I can't remember what it is. And thankfully, some of the utility providers took the opportunity to proactively upgrade some of their infrastructure. You know, we gave them, the department works with the utility contractors through NAROC and at a divisional level through DROC committees. And as part of the BRT project, I, I provided the DROC committee with regular updates on what we would be doing within BRT in the year and in the coming years to try to forward them of this work coming up and to try to give them the opportunity. Like a positive example would be NI Water took the opportunity along the section of the Upper Newton Arge Road from Albert Bridge Road to Sandown Road to replace all their lead connections, old lead connections to houses as we were running through. Now the contractor, the BRT principal contractor might not thank you for that amount of additional works, but I would say the, prob the public probably would in save time later on, you know. Um, the second part of your question, red routes and thing, probably falls outside the scope of this discussion, if you know what I mean, Bert, and it's not something that we, we didn't request a change in policy for Northern Ireland for this, but I think it probably is something that the department should consider in future because as the years go on, um, traffic appears to be only getting worse and there's always that suppressed demand. So even if you introduce a new public transport system that attracts thousands, literally thousands and thousands of new users every day, there is still this issue of suppressed demand within the car owners of Northern Ireland where congestion might not, you know, your rush hour traffic doesn't get any higher. It only spreads out, you know, so It'll be constantly on a pull that I would suggest. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. I've written it four or five times actually. Um, right now I'm talking over Strand and I am from the Baymac up the Springfield Road. So I rode it through town and then walked up the Springfield Road to the Clay campus. I've talked to a few people sitting beside me on, on the younger women and the family people. You know, the more buggy capacity and stuff like that during the day and all. And then in the mornings, there was a bit of a couple at the start because there's a proximity switch across the doors. Mm -hmm. And if you're too close to the front of the door, the door will close. And I'm not sure that the driver knew what was going on, but 
people in the community can't just be open the back, but they have to stay back about three inches from the doors. But without party fans, it's, it's very good. I thought well done. Thanks, thanks very much. I have to say, we found the same. You know, with all these things, there's obviously going to be teething problems in the first days, weeks of operation, as the public get used to the new system, and also as the operator gets used to the new system. You know, but I think um, over the last two months, there's been some significant changes made that is definitely it's making it much smoother, and the reliability figures that we are seeing for Glider now is class leading across um, Metro in Belfast, so the, uh, I'm not going to steal a future presentation where TransLink are going to report on um, how Glider is performing, but so far we're seeing very positive things in all those aspects, but thanks for the positive comments as well. What's the current success? Are there any plans to develop onto alternatives? Okay, well, previous ministers, you know yourself, we don't have a assembly at the minute, so we don't have any new policies or new things being announced, but previous ministers had given an indication that any future phases of, of BRT would serve north and south Belfast. Now, we've just commenced route identification, and it's fair to say that that's very much in its infancy. Um, and subject to funding. So if BRT2 was to be introduced, you could imagine that maybe to the south, the Ormo Road, St. Field Road corridor towards Carrie Duff might be a natural route for it. And in the north, um, the route options would include probably Crumlin Road, Antrim Road and Shore Road. But it, all those things would all be subject to the success of phase one and available funding. Uh, John's going to offer a light here as far as question concerns, Ron. But I'm not you you get him, Ronnie. Right. <laughs> my question actually, I don't know if it's the department or like TransLink, it's about the design uh, of the vehicle. And um, mm -hmm. there's been lots of comments about the ratio of standing to seating accommodation on it. Would there be you or the uh, TransLink care to comment? Do they intend to change this, or is this the formula that they intend to stick with? Yeah, it, it, it's a feature of Belfast, or sorry, of bus rapid transit vehicles, Ronnie. That it's it's a, and mass transit as a as an idea. You know, as you move up through mass transit onto trolley buses and trams and things like that, there generally tends to be less seating and more standing because you can get more more people in, and it suits. Uh, it suits a service like Belfast, where the journey time isn't that much. You know, you're talking half an hour standing or whatever. But I take your point that, for example, a double deck bus might have 70 seats, whereas the BRT vehicle has 45, albeit both of them have a carrying capacity of over 100. But if you consider that the entire top deck of a double deck bus is inaccessible to a large number of people, um, the idea of any of these mass rapid transit systems is that you get the people off, you get you know you get them on, you get them off as quickly as you can to reduce the dwell times. So it, it's the nature of how those things go. Um, within the vehicle itself, like I say, it's very typical of the type of vehicle. Um, what we were keen to do was to increase the space, the circulation space within the vehicle and to provide enough space for wheelchair users and prams and buggies. So the decision was made to make the front portion of the cabin the place for the wheelchair spaces and to try to encourage people with prams and buggies to go to the rear of the cabin so that you would reduce a sort of a historic conflict that has got on where those two user groups were vying for the same area, you know, but I, I alluded earlier and as Bert mentioned we worked very closely with MCAC who represent the disabled lobby on the design of the vehicle so what Van Hull the vehicle manufacturer did early on in their design was they mocked up a wooden front portion of the cabin with the wheelchair space and priority seating spaces 
and we brought MTAC to uh, the old Bell or the old Duncrew Translate Depot, showed them what it was like, let the users on it, use it, and to feedback on it. And from that engagement, it was absolutely invaluable because what we actually did then, some of the seats in the front portion that were sort of sitting out were changed to tip up seats, which are very useful for people who have guide dogs, where the guide, where the guide dog can be in, out of the way, and the person still has the seat. And also we, t we made some changes to the orientation uh, of the wheelchair space from that exercise. So there was a lot of thought put into the design of the vehicles. An observation more than anything else. Um, I'm very proactive for public transport and I think this is a great solution for Belfast. But one of my day jobs, I also have to look at getting cars through traffic lights. Um, and one of the observations I've noticed is that when you have a junction with two lanes coming through the signals, when you get to the other side, not all the cars can get through the junction before they hit the, the bus thing or they're at the transit lane. Is there any proposals to monitor that or is there any options to maybe increase that merge by a couple of vehicles because it would make a big difference? Yeah, that, that was something that we considered during the design of it and I'm sorry that Sean Foy and Damien Murray managed to slope off before the question that was aimed at them, but there was a lot of transport modelling that was carried out and the, the decision was made at some junctions, particularly the, the sort of critical junctions along the route, so like of um, Knock Road, Upper Newton Arch Road Junction, to have that leader or the, the, com the, the commencement paper at the far side of the junction um, quite a bit down to allow that merge. There are some other quieter junctions along the route where we made the decision where we were actively discouraging the straight ahead traffic to take up the two lanes. So at those short, smaller junctions, we were really encouraging the left hand lane really to be only taken up by left turning cars into side roads so that to try to keep one single lane of traffic discharging properly is better than two lanes discharging and then getting into a muddle at the far side. So. It was very much on a site by site basis. Um, however, we have given a commitment to monitor the entirety of the BRT network within the first year, and fairly simple changes like that is is, is something that we we will be looking at and continuing to look at, and we'll be tweaking as and where we require it. Oh yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, thanks again. John, presentation. We're starting in. New campus with 15,000 staff and students coming online here. Uh, how are you going to connect with the future considerations slide up? How are you going to connect what you have here to the university? Are you thinking of connecting it across the wagon? Uh, or is there some other way? I'm thinking of a bridge, not a current, or is there some other way that you can think of getting uh, the uh, system to connect to here. Yeah. Well, Robert, there's there's definitely bigger things alluded to in your thing than would be covered by BRT or or, or a BRT phase two, but it's fair to say that we've had we we are engaged with other providers. For example, the University of Ulster and um, Department for Communities with their Streets Ahead projects and Clifton Gateway, you know, environmental improvement schemes, things like that. Um, to sort of future-proof any, any of their developments to allow for a BRT phase two. So in right outside the front door, we have initially earmarked a couple of locations for BRT halts, should any of that happen in the future. But it, from our point of view, from a project point of view, we're, we're gazing too far for that at this stage, but I take your point. Thank you.